name is Bud Burton Moss. I am 87 years of age. My life from 11 years old to 17 was a normal life like any Jewish kid growing up in West LA. Being born at the Hollywood Children's Hospital, there was something that it all of a sudden became part of my life. I could see Hollywood Boulevard from the, uh, from the, from, from the room where my, my mom gave birth to me. My dad was from the Bronx. My mother came over on the last boat from Russia in 1906. And her brother, Sam Zimbalist, became one of Hollywood's greatest producers ever. He made films with Gable and Tracy called Boomtown and Tortilla Flats, the Steinbeck classic. And the last movie that he made was Ben-Hur, which I think received 12 Oscars. Sadly, the day after the famous chariot race, he was on the phone with MGM trying to get another $5 million. And out of nowhere, he died right on the set at that time, never to see his work being shown to the world. So my dad was a film editor at Fox Studios during the 40s and 50s. And he was one of the editors of a film called Blood and Sand. And one day we went, my mom and me, to a screening, which I'd never been to before, at Fox Studios. The minute Rita Hayworth came on the screen, I leaned over to my mom and I said, Mom, she's almost as beautiful as you are. She has the same color red hair. And that started this long, long journey wanting to know what bullfighting was like and who was Rita Hayworth and was I ever going to meet her. My dad got me a summer job at the commissary at Fox Studios and as I was cleaning off the tables over in the section near Shirley Temple's table, in walked the great Daryl F. Zanuck with Rita Hayworth on his arm. I froze. I said to myself, good God, I've waited since I was 11 years old to meet Rita Hayworth. I said, is this the time that I'm going to ask her to please be patient and wait another couple more years until I'm 18 or 21 and then we can start dating? Maybe she'd even think about letting me talk to her about getting married. And I'm having all of these fantasies and all of a sudden I get hit in the head with a wet towel and it's the maitre d' who said, Moss, wake up and go clean off table 10. And I became a theater arts major in college, Los Angeles City and State College. And there were these young, uh, young actors like uh, Robert Vaughn, uh, Jimmy Colburn, Hugh O'Brien became my best friend. And we all kind of grew up wanting to be actors. And uh, when I graduated, I went into the Air Force during the Korean conflict. And when that was over, I decided I wanted to go to Mexico and become the great next Manolete. And I went there hoping to stay a year and find out what bullfighting's like. When I came down with a terrible cold, it was almost like pneumonia. And my friends drove me to the border to Juarez to get a penicillin shot at the border there. And two weeks later, I found out that I had hepatitis. I almost died in Mexico, and I came back, like they said, a 98-pound weakling, and uh, decided to get more involved in the industry. And it was at that time I was going back to the bullfights in Tijuana, and there was Tony Quinn at the famous Caesar Hotel, and he waved to me. He says, Bud, come on over. I want to talk to you. And he's sitting with a bunch of people, and he said, this is Ruth Roman, who I just got through making a film with. And Ruth and I started talking. And it turned out that she was just in the process of separating after a, I think, a short marriage. She had a little son and we became kind of everything we talked about. We kept going down the same pathway. And when I started talking about going to Spain one day, she said, we should do that together. Ruth had gone to Paris to make a film. And when she came back, she was on the ill-fated Andrea Doria that sank off the coast of New York back in 1956, I was supposed to be on that boat. But as it turned out, I couldn't go to Paris with her for this film. And I went to New York to meet her, to get her off, help get off the boat. 
and she lost her son. She didn't, she put her son into the life raft thinking that she was going to be safe. It was shortly thereafter that we decided that we were going to get married. And where are we going to go for our honeymoon? Off to Spain. We traveled for five, almost two years in Spain, following Dominguin and Manolete and all the great matadors in Spain. So that was kind of my adventure with, uh, with Ruth Roman. Carolyn uh, had a very successful career going at the time, and a director uh, had a great script called The Mask Maker. It dealt with a warm, lovely, talented woman that everybody loved, but she was kind of like a wallflower. She had a boyfriend who never said, let's get married. Her biggest problem, as much as everybody loved her, she had a rather big nose. And it seems in the story, she met Dr. Kildare, she met Richard Chamberlain, she said, plastic surgery today has become so popular that we'd like to have you meet this doctor. I called Carolyn and I said, I have this great script that I think you're gonna like, and I would like to send it over to have you read it. She did the show, great success. During that time, she and Aaron Spelling, her husband, who she, she was the power behind the throne. She made Aaron Spelling the most powerful TV producer in Hollywood. And from then on, his career was, was nonstop. So we started dating, and before we knew it, Aaron had finally moved out of the house. He would call her morning, noon, and night. I had a little apartment over on Beverly Glen after I separated from Ruth Roman, and before you knew it, under a veil of darkness, I had moved most of my things over to 907 North Beverly Drive, and Aaron got very, very upset. And Aaron had been drinking, and he said, you tell Bud, I'm gonna come over there and kill him. And about a half hour later, we hear the scraping of a front end of a fender pulling into our driveway, and it was Larry Gordon driving Larry, Aaron's big uh, limousine. I hear him banging at the door, and it's Carolyn, she's hysterical, and I get into my jogging outfit, I go down the stairs, I open the front door, and he's throwing a punch at me. Just as I open the door, I grabbed his arm, threw him around, hit him in the stomach, he leaned over, kicked me in the groin, we're now on the front step of the house, with cars driving by, trying to throw punches at each other, and Larry Gordon is screaming and yelling, and Carolyn's in her nightgown, trying to pull me and Aaron apart. We finally get Aaron in the house. He's cut up, I'm cut up, <clears throat> and he starts to cry. And he says, Aaron, I'm, Carol, I'm sorry I did this. I just love you so much, and I love you, but I just needed to, 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 to tell you how I feel. And finally, after Carol and I broke up through a, on a blind date, I was fixed up with a young girl by the name of Carolyn Gary. And my brother Dan Moss, who's a prominent Los Angeles attorney, was married to Vicki Carr, whom I introduced him to at the time. And she was singing that night. And I had said to this attorney who was close to Carolyn, I'd love to invite her to the Vicki Carr show. And he said, well, I'll have her call you. So she called and she said, is this Buddy Morris? And I said, no, it's Bud Moss, who is this? And she said, well, this is Carolyn Gary and I was told to call you and I understand you'd like to invite me. I'm very busy, Mr. Morris, she said, but if you'd like to invite me, I'd like to go and see Vicki Carr with you. We dated for a year. We ended up living together for a year on and off. And when we decided to get married, we heard that this little shack here in Westwood was for sale and we ended up buying it. Sydney was my best man. I remember when it was for my 40th birthday, he said, if you want to make it to 50, you got to do me a favor. You got to stop drinking. You got to go over to UCLA and we're going to start exercising. You're going to lose some weight because right now he says, you're really not in that good shape and I don't want anything to happen to you. So we went over to UCLA weeks later, started walking. I could barely do a quarter of a mile, which turned into a half a mile, into a mile. 
And it was through Sydney that I ended up jockeying for over 30 years at UCLA. And Sydney quite often would come with me. I'd pick him up and he would do the stairs five, 10 rows at a time. And I'm barely going up the first or second row while he was doing that. It was a very close relationship that we had over the years. It was in 1967 that I put together a film for Rita called The Bastards. That was, and I, this was the promise that I made to her when I saw her in 1960 with Bing Crosby. I said, I'm gonna find you a movie, Rita. What finally happened is uh, while we were in Spain, there were these little breakdowns and we sensed something, but we weren't quite sure what it was at the time. It was a couple years later. It was the first time that I traveled with Rita and from the time that we got on the airplane, Rita out of nowhere stood up and started yelling at this girl and hauled off and slapped her and said, God damn you, Gary Cooper, you're gonna leave all those sluts alone. You keep saying that you're coming back to me, but you never have. I hate you and I hate you. And the stewardess went to the pilot and told her that she had hauled off and hit her. I'm sure he, they notified the airport that something was happening and when we got landed, the captain came back and said, Mr. Moss, we're in trouble. I said, what is it? He said, there's at least 50 in press waiting at the door. Those days you could go right up to the door of the aircraft waiting to see you and Rita Hayworth. The captain said, I will get a portable staircase and bring it to the back of the plane and help you get Rita off. And there's a picture, a horrific photograph of Rita with her hair in her face, looked like that she'd been doped up when we got to the Savoy Hotel under our door were these pictures and notes saying, if we don't see Rita immediately, we're gonna publish this picture. And her daughter said, bud, mom's gonna stop working. Mm. We're gonna to have to find out what's wrong with her. And it wasn't until 1980 that we found out that it was Alzheimer's. I mean, I think that I could say that I've met some of the greatest people in the world, and yet my greatest enjoyment is still taking a lot of these young kids over here at UCLA and getting them their first reading for a television show or a movie. So I would say loving my wife as I do, being very grateful for my son, who's almost 45 years of age now, that I've been blessed by those dear people above and I'm very thankful to be doing what I'm doing at 87. And God knows I'm looking forward to 88. I think it was Mickey Mantle who once said, if I knew that I was gonna live this long, I'd probably take better care of myself. And I, I look back to what uh, Sydney encouraged me to do, to start jogging and stay healthy. I don't think without Sydney's encouragement, I'd be sitting here with you today. No, he's gotta have proof. Suppose he had the proof. What then? Jack, he should have called the cops. And a, yeah, and the cops would have kept the loot for themselves, too. Right. Yeah, Could know. be. Not the FBI. Oh. And that magic harp. Hmm? If the giant would have been so bad, the harp would have wanted to be snatched. Could be. Now, why do you suppose that magic harp liked that giant so much? I know. You do? Because the giant, he liked music. <laughs> that Jack was a real heist man. He got away with burglary three I, times. I, I like the part where he knocked off the giant. Okay. The whole thing here is a phony.